Welcome back to another episode. I'm Marcus Philly here, and guess what? They're chopping trees outside. So I want to start out by saying I apologize if there's any noise disturbances during this episode, but don't worry about it because they're chopping trees, and today we are building tree trunk legs. Yep, it's leg day here at Functional Bodybuilding. I've been joined by a couple uh, people in the gym, namely Shauna Guzman, going to hit this leg session with me, and I'm going to show you how I go through the leg session, what we're doing, the thoughts behind some of the movements, and hopefully give you some insight into training. This is another training breakdown from Functional Bodybuilding. So I'm opening up with some sled work, and as you can see, I am cozied up. It is chilly out here. It's February. We've been having a cold, rainy winter, so I got my jacket on. I got my pants on. I got my boots on, and hopefully those layers will be coming off shortly, um, but sled work is so great for the ankles, the knees, and the hips. I love to throw in some leg extensions and some calf raises as well into my warm-ups just to get a little localized blood flow to the areas that are going to get the most training today, especially when we do squats, so pumping up the calves, getting mobility in the ankles. Actually, one thing of note is that calf raises, when done correctly, might be the most effective way to mobilize ankles, in my opinion, because you get a loaded stretch at the bottom. If you really choose to pause for longer periods of time at the bottom of your calf raises, you could see massive ankle improvement. Now, if you don't have a sled, you don't need to do this exact same warm-up where I push the sled to knee extensions or leg extensions and calf raises. Instead, if you don't have these machines either, you could do banded leg extensions on the floor. You could do standing calf raises with your toes elevated on a surface like a, a weight plate. And for the sled, actually because the sled is really all about pumping up the quads and getting some blood flow through the feet, one thing you could do is you could actually do a little bit of like a, called like a pike flutter. So you sit on the floor and you get your legs out in front of you and you pike flutter those legs. What that's gonna do is it's gonna pump a lot more uh, blood into the hip flexors, into the quads to go along with those banded leg extensions. So don't worry if you don't have that. You might wanna instead maybe put in a bike or some cardio element to just raise the body temperature and get the blood flowing. Now on, on a squat day, upper body mobility work, uh, especially through the thoracic spine, also has its place and it, and it absolutely can help you get into better positions. So you also see me doing some dip supports in my warm up. I was doing a little bit of a thoracic extensions over a medicine ball, where, uh, which we didn't capture, but both of those getting my upper body feeling loose and feeling like it can open up, especially if I'm gonna be doing back rack anything, uh, can be really great for getting into better positions on a leg day. Now I'm into a new training build with my back squats. So the repetition focus is gonna be on the eight to 10 repetition range for three working sets. And because it's kind of the first week of a training build, I'm gonna be hitting all of my working sets in the seven, seven out of 10 RPE zone. What that means is a seven out of 10 effort, I like to quantify by saying the last repetition that I do in my set, my 10th rep, means I probably had around three more reps in the tank before I hit mechanical failure or form failure. Now, pushing effort is super important when you're trying to see results in your resistance training, and effort looks different depending on the exercise you're doing, depending on the person, but using that guide to say, hey, I am three repetitions away from my technique breaking down from, from me not getting the focused effort on the quads or whatever the movement um, and muscle group I'm trying to train that day is, that is a great universal cue for everybody to kind of keep in mind and really work on figuring out where those limits are. Now, because I was taking slightly longer rest periods and because I'm recovering a shoulder injury, I was doing kettlebell arm bars and kettlebell overhead carries during these rest periods because, again, I'm trying to continue to rehabilitate my shoulder, which got tweaked early in February, um, I, like towards the end of January, early February, just from intense training and not being so diligent about my recovery. But I find that doing loaded carries is a great way to work on the stability of the joint as the tissues are healing. So I'm not going through a lot of range of motion. I'm not doing a lot of pressing right now, but instead carrying, that's gonna strengthen the rotator cuff, all the things that are gonna support that joint. Because I have some underlying um, tears and issues in there from years ago, they get aggravated sometimes and I have to kind of go back to stability and mobility as my focus, not so much on concentric and eccentric loading of the shoulder. Yeah. 
Now for my Nordics, I'm gonna be working on unassisted sets for this training build. Today, I was getting close to six to eight reps, which is starting to become a much more confident rep range for me on this movement. About a year and a half ago, I couldn't do a single Nordic unassisted. And as a matter of fact, I had to control the negative with my hands or support the negative with my hands just to get a full range of motion. So it's been a goal of mine to develop these ever since I met Ben Patrick, the knees over toes guy, and he started emphasizing them in my training. And I just like learning any skill but it, it takes this time to progress, it really does. I, learning new skills is not gonna happen quickly, especially if there's strength requirements involved. So there you go, 18 months and I'm able to do six to eight reps on a consistent basis. And I think that is even accelerated progress for most people. I started with banded variations on this exercise, I also did negatives for a long time, and that really helped me build my strength rep by rep. Next up, I was gonna perform ATG split squats. I started these sets uh, building with a hand supported position. You can see I'm holding on to the safety spotter arm in the squat rack. After about two to three sets getting kind of building up in weight, I moved away from the hand support. Um, and, and after several weeks of this build, I'll be going into more of just doing only a suitcase variation of this. So it's like, Working hand support is a great way to start in a training build or maybe doing one training build where you're working on hand support in this movement. It's gonna help you develop good motor control, maybe get into deeper positions where you can really feel the stretch in the knee, the hip, and the ankle. But then over time, working on performing this exercise with no support um, and just free, free weights in the middle of the room is also gonna develop a ton of balance and a ton of coordination to go along with the strength and mobility gains you'll get from it. Now moving on to the final section, which is going to be a quad superset. So I'm gonna use the leg extension machine because we have one here at the facility, but in a superset format that I'm doing here, I'm gonna hit leg extensions for 15 reps, and then I'm gonna move directly into cyclist squats. I'm gonna be holding kettlebells in the rack position. I'm gonna do a 10 second isometric, followed by 10 slow reps, then finish with a 10 second isometric. So these are 10, 10, 10 cyclist squats. Now leg extensions, paired with these 10, 10, 10 cyclist squats. I love putting isometric holds into training. I already talked about them a little bit actually earlier, which um, when I was talking about kettlebell carries, so the overhead carry or the arm bar, this sort of straight arm strength where I'm not really having to do some dynamic contractions. I'm just holding a joint at a particular angle under load which is going to force the muscles that surround that joint to really work on some muscle endurance and some isometric strength now i'm not at the very very bottom of this cyclist squat because if i were to re relax at the bottom of the cyclist squat i wouldn't actually be holding tension on my quads i would be really just getting a stretch and feeling quite relaxed so i'm holding at about 90 de uh, a 90 degree angle of my hip um basically my thighs at parallel that's going to force those quads to work really hard. And then after 10 seconds of kind of fatiguing them with an isometric, I'll do those 10 slow reps. And then the final 10 second isometric is the absolute burn. Seems like every time I get ahead. So the bulk of the weight training is all done for the day. Those were my working sets. That was where I was getting all my intensity. I'm really focusing today on my lower body, as you saw, with a lot of upper body mobility work and exploration just for my shoulder. I really am getting two intensive training days a week because when I can focus on my lower body during this shoulder recovery period, I'm challenging myself and pushing myself. The rest of the week, I will be doing lighter upper body sessions. I'll be doing more mixed modal cardiovascular training sessions or Metcons, other things that I can do to keep my movement up, to keep my shoulder moving and rehabbing as I'm coming back off of this injury. I did finish today with some weighted mobility. I used two exercises that I love for loaded mobility. One is the Jefferson curl, and then the other is a, a straddle pull through. And this is with the cable machine. Both of these really help me to get into positions that are hard for me when I'm not using weight. I think training range of motion under load or the combination of strength and range 
is really the ticket that we have to truly improving our mobility. When I've done static stretching with just my body weight versus when I have done weight training to extended ranges of motion with a focus on trying to achieve greater range with each working rep, I've seen much better results with loaded stretching and improving my overall mobility. So the Jefferson Curl for me is terrific. It helps me to open up my upper back. It helps me to open up behind my knees. So where my hamstrings and calves meet behind my knees. And it's always been a great way for me to keep some good mobility and health in my low back. Now, the Jefferson Curl loaded up is not for everybody. And if you have a history of back a back injury and bending over forward bothers it, then I would take extreme caution with the Jefferson curl and perhaps not choose to load it and really focus on things like RDLs where you keep your back in a neutral position throughout the range of motion. And then with the uh, cable straddle pull throughs, the straddle position is one that is very difficult for me to stretch and train without some weighted load because I'm so tight there. So using a cable machine, playing around with the positions that I can get into really helps me explore my adductors, my hamstrings um, to, again, open up those positions, feel better, and wrap up a really solid day of training. If you like what you saw today, please give us a thumbs up. I'd love to see what questions that you have down in the comments. Let's engage there and more training breakdowns to come in the future. Let me know what you'd love to see.